kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see so many people here interested in this lecture. It's also a great pleasure to, to see such a great attendance at the Autism Europe meeting, uh, not only from Europe, people coming, but from all over the world. And it's very, very important that we meet each other, that we exchange our thoughts and perspectives and experiences. Uh, it's wonderful. I would also like to particularly welcome all autistic people and all autistic researchers um, and hope that this conference is sufficiently autism friendly and that you will find that it, it's informative and relevant to you. And I would also apologize as I have been part of the scientific committee that we were not more attentive, for instance, to the clapping and flapping and to flashlights and other things. Good, um, but let's get started. Um, uh, one thing is um, after the lunch break, usually it's a little bit of a challenge, not so much for me, but more for you, because, um, because we have about five liters of blood in our body, and after the lunch break, usually that blood uh, wants to go down to the bowels and do some work there, and there's not so much left in the brain, so we'll try to keep the blood up in the brain. So um, I'm starting with a little with a little story or an experience that I have made now several times when we have employed new people at our clinical department uh, in Stockholm. And when I'm asking people, clinicians, candidates, um, what they think is, is important when it comes to autism assessment and what they, what they think they will be doing when they come to our department, I've often uh, received the answer that they think it's, it's mostly about well, checking diagnostic status and, uh, and looking if the symptoms are there to make um, a diagnosis of autism according to the manuals. Um, and I'm always a little bit disappointed about that because I think, um, of course, it's important to establish a diagnosis because it's formally important, it's important for documentation and also for research. But um, if we want to help people, help the families and give adequate support, that can only be the beginning. We need to understand far more. We need to understand an individual and um, the family and the whole environment around the individual to understand where are the strengths, where are the difficulties, where are the resources, the possibilities, where are the needs, and where are the barriers, and where are the facilitators. Um, and of course, we'd also need to know what actually the individual her or himself thinks about the situation and ask about the well-being. So, um, I know I'm not the first to show you an iceberg, I know that, but um, I think we need to go and leave the idea behind that we can only work with the diagnostic manuals, DSM-5 and now ICD-11 coming, talk about symptoms and diagnosis, we need to go as a standard uh, much, much further and we need to look more at functioning and quality of life. So. Um, my conclusions first, just to give you an idea what this will be about. So I'm going to argue strongly and I will try to convince you that we will need to shift focus in diagnostic assessment, which I think now is overly focused on making a diagnosis and I think also overly focused on looking at autism severity, not only in the assessment, but also in the definition of, of, of intervention and support targets. And we need to shift the focus more to assessment of functioning and quality of life um, in that process. And that this, that this shift is, is actually a prerequisite and it's really of paramount importance to achieve also some kind of uh, paradigm shift towards more improved understanding of autism as a whole, but also each individual and to, to generate better support and interventions. And I think for those people who work um, in, in their practice with these questions, they will appreciate if they get adequate instruments and frameworks to do this. Um, and I will mostly also talk about the international classification of functioning and the core sets that we have developed to facilitate exactly this process. So a little bit of the basics, just so that, that we have the same understanding. So what is, what is functioning? What kind of concept is that? So it's, um, it's the resulting abilities and disabilities of a person as an interaction 
between the, into, in the individual and the environment that individual is living in. So you can say it's, an, it's a person in his or her own world. And what is quality of life? And we sometimes also say health-related quality of life, because in autism we talk about quality of life in, in face of a condition. It's, um, it's the individually experienced satisfaction with life, well-being and happiness. Uh, and it's, it's very important that we are, that we are, um, that we do um, assess quality of life as, as a primary perspective thing. So per, per definition, quality of life is something that only the individual, her himself, can express. Uh, also because we have, um, there's good evidence from many studies showing that the convergence of proxy ratings of quality of life and uh, of individually kind of expressed quality of life by an individual, they do not match very well. For instance, we can see in typical development that, uh, for instance, uh, relatives, they often overestimate the quality of life of their children, and it's the other way around in autism. So when we look at functioning in autism, that's a, that's a whole universe. It's an, it's an ocean of studies that we have aggregated, and I'm often wondering why we're not using them a lot more uh, in assessment and also in treatment targets. I'm just, I'm just showing you just a little, little bit of all of this. So, for instance, when we come to when we come to body functions, for instance, we know that executive functioning uh, is a challenge for a lot of people on the spectrum. Uh, you already heard quite a bit about sleep. For instance, sleep is something that is um, occurring very often in autism and can generate a lot of functional disabilities and also a lot of um, mental health issues in the long run. Um, we see when we come to more to the environmental side of functioning that people with autism have far too low employment rates. Uh, they should be a lot higher. There's a lot that we can change in the environment, in the employment place to make it easier accessible uh, for people on the spectrum and to appreciate that they actually have a lot of abilities that they could use in the workplace. This is my first Swedish lesson to all of you. There's one more. So, um, and this is about how people on the spectrum do, for instance, in schools. We had a huge discussion in Sweden some weeks ago because there was an, an estimation of how, how many people uh, how many children uh, are not going to school, uh, have school absenteeism, kind of large, large parts of time where they not go to school, and there's no, there's no other reason for that, that they just refuse school. And we, it's, it's an estimation that we have about five to 6,000 children who refuse school, who have large times where they're not going, and it's a substantial minority. It's people with new developmental conditions, especially autism. And then in general, this is for instance a well-known study by Pat Howlin, that when we look at the development over time and when we look at adult outcomes, we see that a lot of adult people on the spectrum still have um, comparably low outcomes when it comes to independent living and when it comes um, uh, to, to happiness and, and everything else. Um, when we look at quality of life, and this is a very nice a systematic uh, review and meta-analysis uh, from Hilde Gertz and, and the colleague. You heard Hilde this morning already. Um, and um, they were looking at how is quality of life uh, over the lifespan and looked at studies um, and found that um, a, when, you, when you take quality of life measures, and I will talk more about these measures later on and their value, uh, you can see that there's a there's a difference about one standard deviation between neurotypical and autistic people. And for you who know what an effect size is, you know that's, that's quite a considerably high um, figure. And that's very disappointing, of course, because if we, if we look at autism and would compare autism conceptually, for instance, to mental health diagnosis, uh, the many mental health diagnoses we have uh, kind of implicitly Per definition, we have lower quality of life. For instance, when you have panic attacks, when you have severe anxiety disorder, when you have depression, of course, that's connected automatically with low quality of life. It's almost impossible to have, to have a happy depression. 
but um, there's absolutely no reason why we should not have happy autism. Um, another thing is that also quality of life often is reduced in the, in the immediate environment, um, in the families. Um, and a very, very important thing is that when we look at, at functions and their relations to quality of life, and you heard this already in other talks, um, there's for some, for some functions there's a quite, it's a quite close relation. And we can see that, for instance, very important aspects of functioning like, like self-regulation, that, that they are very, very good at, for instance, um, make, a, make a prognosis of the experienced quality of life of a person. And the same is also true for, for sleep. These are very good predictors of quality of life. So it's also very important to know which of the functions that we are looking at and which we are address, which are maybe the most important things for people's experiencing of their life quality. When we go a little bit further to intervention targets, and this is a lovely study by Helen McConaughey and, and colleagues, um, the question was, um, what are the preferred treatment, treatment targets when you ask parents? And you can see that uh, ranked number one is, again, is happiness. So it's, of course, like all parents, parents want their children to be happy. And when you go through those lists, uh, lists here, you can see that, for instance, also mental health is a very important aspect. Uh, sensory issues is an important aspect. Distress is very important. So um, you can see that um, these treatment targets are not so much about autism severity or kind of the autism diagnosis itself. It's mostly about um, other things. Um, and this little statistic uh, that I brought from uh, something that we are doing, we're having a, a program that we call Transition, so where we try to help older adolescents and young adults to, to, um, to reach a certain level of independence, to get an idea of what they want to do when it comes to work, uh, when it comes to education, get an idea of, of finances, of housing, um, also looking more at their own health uh, and their social networks and so forth. And um, in, this, in this program, we, we start mostly in the beginning to, um, to try together with the people who participate, try to come up together with them with goals um, that they want to achieve. Uh, so we make a hierarchy of, of, of things that they would like to change in their life or kind of prospectively work on. It's, we, do, we do not use too many goals because that gets very confusing, but often we, we have two or three goals. And in the right column here, you can see what the participants in this study um, were kind of mostly saying what their primary goals were. And you can see that, for instance, health and mental health and somatic health was um, was one of the goals that was most important to the participants. Um, and for instance, when it comes to social aspects, there were also a lot of goals in trying to generate social networks, but not necessarily always also being forced to participate in lots of social um, arenas. Um, we're having more and more autistic uh, researchers also in the autism research community, which is, which is a great thing to happen. Um, and there's also a lot of activists um, and self-advocates in that field. And when we look at what, what they are mostly um, um, demanding and think which would be the best um, outcomes to, to look at when we do studies, uh, they're mostly using a social model of disability so um, the idea is that we should not so much address people on the autism spectrum themselves and trying to get them to do things and to adapt, but also we need to look more at the environment. So what kind of potential is there in the environment to get more, to give more acceptance, to be more tolerant, to generate environments where people on the spectrum can function more well. So, so this is about also generating targets in the environment and not only targets in the individual. So, it's, so we can think that there are both treatment targets in an individual, but also a lot of them outside of the individual if we want to achieve things 
for people on the spectrum. This is a study that um, appeared um, in autism um, just, uh, I think, just some month ago. Uh, and uh, my colleagues from Italy looked, when we looked at um, the trials that have been conducted in autism, what were the outcome measures? So were they, for instance, uh, was it a lot in quality of life? Was it a lot about functioning? Was it about the preferred treatment targets? And when we look here, you can see that um, the absolutely largest part is about autism symptoms and autism symptom reduction. There is, um, there's, there's less, far less, on, for instance, uh, functioning and also um, physical and, uh, and somatic and uh, psychiatric health. And there's uh, three studies of these 406 where actually quality of life was measured. And then we, when we look at um, how well, were there any treatment targets coming to environmental accommodation, um, as far as I can see, there's zero in this study. So um, I hope I could make a little bit of point that I think there's a certain discrepancy between what's actually preferred, maybe, and also sometimes needed, and how we in autism research and also in clinical departments often still uh, approach uh, issues. So I think if we rethink, um, then we can detect the actually quality of life and functioning um, reflect a lot better the needs and the priorities by stakeholders. And there are other, other reasons why I think we, it's worthwhile to, to think and act differently. Another thing is that um, I think when we talk about functioning and quality of life, it's far less stigmatizing. It's also less controversial than talking about only diagnosis and symptoms. Um, I think it's more, more meaningful, kind of immediately more meaningful and maybe also more important than only addressing symptoms. It's surely a lot more um, adequate to describe an individual's challenges and the difficulties that, are, that they are in real life. Um, it's surely also better to give us an immediate guide, a guiding for uh, which, maybe, which maybe are the individual um, treatment goals that we should focus on. Uh, when it comes to costs and money, which is also a very important thing that we should not naively ignore. Um, it's, um, and that's why, for instance, the, the healthcare authorities in, in Stockholm, region of Stockholm, where I live, are also quite interested of, of this work, is because it's probably also more adequate to actually get an idea of uh, what, what, what will be the individual costs um, when we do a certain support or intervention. Uh, means uh, when we implement them, at least a lot more appropriate than just having diagnosis-related uh, costs calculations. Another important aspect is that of communication. Um, when we use terminology when it comes to quality of life and functioning, often we use words and we use concepts that are far easier to understand for everyone who is involved in, in autism, and that's, we know that many, many people in many, many different places with different, um, with different ideas and routines uh, and, and, um, and work experience. Then an important point also is it gives us the opportunity to, to stress the individual strength that people have, while severity often, per definition, is only about the challenges. And another very important point is it also stresses the, the environmental responsibility for an individual functioning and for the individual experienced quality of life. And something that I'm always very, uh, very fond of is that I think if we, because I'm socialized in child psychiatry, and I think if we would talk more about functioning and quality of life, that would actually be quite sympathetic for uh, the work that psychiatry is doing and would probably also increase psychiatry's credibility. So how can we measure then quality of life if we want to? At the moment, it's, it's quite a huge range of instruments that are used and that's, there's um, uh, not so many, there's, there's not a gold standard in that field. Um, I've listed some here 
for you that often have been used, uh, for instance, the PETSQL in pediatric population. There's also the chip or the vice functional impairment scale. There are things like the kid screen, which is an, a genuinely European instrument that's, um, that's open access and is available in almost all, I guess, maybe, maybe all European languages. And the WHO has also provided uh, several measures for quality of life. So these are all reasonable instruments. On the other hand, they also quite, um, they represent quite a heterogeneity of operationalizations of quality of life. And sometimes when you look into the items and how things are, are uh, assessed, you can see it's a little bit of a mix sometimes also of symptoms and aspects of functioning um, and quality of life. So it's not only inquiring about, about well-being and happiness, but also lots of other things. Uh, and the other thing is uh, most of these scales are generic, so they want to, the idea is, can we measure, or can we measure quality of life uh, in the general population or in certain populations? So it's not necessarily autism specific and sometimes it actually makes a lot of sense to have autism specific instruments. Um, again, um, Helen McConaughey and, and uh, her group um, in Scotland, they have worked on a scale that is for quality of life that is recommended by the World Health Organization, the WHO quality of life um, questionnaire. And what they did was that they were trying to adapt these instruments um, to be a better measure of quality of life in autism. And they added a range of items and reformulated items um, that are really trying to tap into um, what quality of life could be in autism. And for instance, there are items like, can, can you be yourself uh, when you are with, with friends and other people that you know well? Just can you, can you be yourself or do you need to, to play a role? Or another important item is um, if you feel that you are okay with autism uh, and autism being an, as an aspect of your, of your identity. So I think it's a very, very useful uh, way of trying to adapt quality of life measures to make them more autism um, specific. When it comes to, um, to functioning, um, we have two scales that are maybe familiar to you. They are both recommended again by the World Health Organization. One is the, uh, the HUDA scale and the other one is the Brief Model Disab Disability Sur uh, Survey. And those of you who are users of the DSM-5 and you have read the, the whole manual, then you will see that actually the DSM-5 will recommend uh, the HODA scale, the 36-item version, to get an idea if, if actually the criterion of impairment is fulfilled uh, in, in any diagnosis of mental disorder. So it's a generic scale to give you an idea of functioning in general. And the brief Model Disability Survey is, is a little bit more comprehensive, but also has the same idea. So, and in, in ICD-11, that will probably appear in the upcoming years in almost all of our countries, both the HODAS and uh, the Brief Model, model Disability Survey are both recommended as, as, as generic measures of functioning uh, for, for the mental health field. Um, both of these scales, so the HUDAS and, and um, the Brief Disability Model Survey, they are both derived from the ICF, and I hope that the ICF is familiar to most of you. If not, it's um, the, the WHO has a whole range of manuals to try to, to systemize everything that you could systemize around health. Um, and the ICD is the most... Uh, well, maybe the most well-known and, and, and also most frequently used manual, but the ICF that was published in 2001, and there's also a version for children and adolescents that came in 2007, is, a, is, is, is meant as a complement to the ICD because the ICD classifies certain diagnoses, um, but is not saying so much about other things around the individual. So what the ICF is trying to do is um, it tries to understand an individual and an individual's functioning 
uh, looking at the abilities and the, uh, and the disabilities of a person and trying to take into account uh, the body, so the body structures, the body functions. Here we have a certain overlap with the ICD, but then also look a lot at the activities and the participation of a person, trying to take into account all of the environmental factors, and there are many, uh, if they pose a barrier or if they are facilitators of functioning, and also look at, at other personal factors um, and if they are barriers or facilitators. So it's a very comprehensive system, and you can all go, for instance, on the homepage of the WHO, and normally also in each of the countries um, there is uh, some kind of national authority uh, where you also can look at the ICF, and if there is a um, translation of the ICF, and there are many translations into many languages, then you will also find it there. Um, I think that the ICF has a lot of advantages, how I see it, especially when, when, when we want to, if you go back to the first things that I said, if we want to achieve this more holistic understanding and derive individualized treatment goals, um, because the ICF um, allows you a pluralistic view of autism. So even though we need to establish a diagnostic status, thereafter we can see um, using the ICF and using to in when we use the ICF categories to inventorize um, the functional world around an individual and in the individual, that it um, gives a comprehensive picture that we cannot derive when we use diagnostic systems that, it, that in the end are meant to be to, to summarize a lot of information with one diagnostic label. The ICF is a little bit the other way around. It wants to, wants to generate a richness of information around an individual. Another, another good thing about the ICF is, as I said before, is that we can also recognize and we can register and use and make visible strength in autism. And when we worked on with the ICF, we, for instance, we, uh, we asked a lot of experts around the world um, about autism strength, and we also had focus groups and we had clinical studies, and we could see in all of those studies um, that many, many people uh, whatever perspective they had would uh, both um, report um, uh, cognitive strength but also personality strength like honesty and loyalty and other things. And that's normally at least I think what the public out there would probably not know. It also gives the opportunity that some things that we have traditionally only looked at in terms of disability maybe actually um, maybe have both sides to it. So special interests, for instance, in autism, and they're very, very frequent, as we know, and they're also quite diverse, can of course have an, a, a disabling aspect to it, but they can also be looked at sometimes as, as expertise that we can not only, well, register as a symptom, but maybe also acknowledge as a strength that we can use, that we can talk about, both to give people on the spectrum uh, a better sense of themselves and to also hear that they have strength and not only disabilities, but also for, again, for the planning of intervention and support. Also important, I guess, for, um, for everyone who works um, with, um, uh, not only with research, but also with the organization of services, is that often when we, when we do assessments, we have, we, have one, we have one numeric output, which is a, is a diagnostic uh, code, uh, and then we have a lots and lots of, of, of text around this. And often uh, the text is very, very, very rich and gives a lot of information around the individual, but is not in the same way made kind of, uh, made kind of easy, less, easier, easier accessible. So when you, when you use codes of the ICF, you could, for instance, if you have a, a rich text describing a person, you can, you, can, you can code the text using the IC, ICF so that you have a very, very um, um, informative um, uh, cluster of, of codes that give you quite a good picture of an individual beyond the diagnostic category. And if we think of, um, 
of, of research, then of course this research uh, would, could also be very rich when you have large um, populations and you have a lot of ICF information, we could do a lot of better research on autism. This is the second Swedish lesson. So um, another thing is good with the ICF, you can, like, as I said, you can make visible the environmental impact or the environmental responsibility uh, in autism. So this is, this is data from, from a survey that um, uh, the Asperger and Autism Society uh, in Stockholm and the Society Attention in Stockholm did 2016 among the members um, of the interest organization. And they were asking, do you have, do you yourself or do you have a, a, a child that experiences school absenteeism? Again, this is a very important issue. Uh, and there were 306 um, uh, members uh, were replying to this survey. And the question was, um, what do you think are the main reasons for that uh, you or your child is not going any longer to the school and well, just resist and refuses to go to school? Um, and it was, um, it, you, you could answer multiple uh, replies and there are things that maybe you are not so extremely surprised of, like for instance, insufficient uh, immediate school environment, uh, bullying, um, or that they have met what they think uh, incompliant teachers, or that the way to the school was very complicated. Um, you may say, or maybe schools may say, or teachers um, may say, well, that's maybe not true. But in the end, we know, I mean, that, that, that's the lived reality of those people who are not going to school and their, uh, their parents. Uh, but my, my favorite, in, in a negative sense, is, is actually the lunch situation. So you see that 25% of those 306, so that's, I don't know, roughly about 85 or so. So 85, you can say, personal or family catastrophes. That's a lot, that's a lot to me is because, or is also because, uh, these schools are not able to provide a lunch situation which is maybe not crowded, not loud, uh, uh, where maybe not a hotspot for bullying and, and other things. Uh, and for instance, for Sweden, which is one of the richest countries in the world and also is describing itself as one of the most modern and advanced countries, I think that's extremely poor. So you can see that's, that's what I mean by environmental responsibility. And as you have many codes for environment in the ICF, these are things that you can make visible that otherwise may not be visible. Um, one thing with the ICF that's, um, that's still a challenge is, on one hand, um, a lot of people do not know that it exists still. Uh, especially also in the field of mental health and psychiatry and the many people who still do not know about the ICF or are not, are not using it or maybe refuse to use it um, because they want to stick to for, mostly to the ICD. Um, that's something that I maybe not understand but, but I think that, that I do understand is that of course people are not, uh, they have never received the training on one hand and the other hand is you can see there's 1,000 685 categories. And if you would use or would need to use all of those categories uh, in your diagnostic assessment, then it would take kind of forever. Uh, uh, so, um, um, one, one, one way to make the ICF more usable and more handy and more accessible in the different uh, uh, practices is that we can generate um, so-called core sets and core sets are, that are there's, it's short lists, short lists of the, of the ICF um, that should include um, the absolutely most relevant uh, categories to describe functioning in face of a certain condition, and it should be based on rigorous evidence. And the idea is also with the, with the ICF core sets is that um, we have a long tradition in, in, in all of the fields where we use diagnostic labels that we also think and have developed a practice around diagnostic uh, labels. So we actually, if we, if we are reali realistic, it, it's good if we have actually uh, something that we can link to our current practice. So I always see that 
my, my uh, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and other disciplines that I work with, uh, it's, it's something that they really desire because, I mean, the practice is not, is not uh, developed to use the ICF, it's developed to use the ICD. So we need to have something from the ICF that actually can, can really link well to an ICD-based practice. Um, and we have, we have developed those um, core sets for autism uh, in the last years together with uh, the so-called ICF research branch, that's a research branch in Switzerland, and together with the World Health Organization. Um, it's, it's quite a comprehensive uh, process. When, always when you work with a WHO, you need to ensure that you have a representation of, of, of all professions that are important for autism, so that's many. And you also need to ensure that you have representatives from all WHO regions uh, when you do this. So our steering committee and all of the studies that we did were extremely international in a way that I have never worked internationally before. Um, which I think is a, is a very important thing too. Um, and what do we do is um, we do four preparatory studies, um, a systematic review of all the literature around functioning. Um, you do an expert survey with colleagues around the world. Uh, you make um, a qualitative study where you do focus groups and interviews with people on the spectrum, with their relatives, people from interest organizations, personal assistants. And then you have a clinical study where you actually take the ICF and uh, go through the ICF for each client that you see in, in the clinical practice. So you have different perspectives. You have the research perspective, you have this perspective um, from the clinic, you have this, uh, the one from, from people themselves, uh, and so forth, and, and, and from clinical uh, personnel. Uh, and then this evidence is taken to, to a conference, not, not as big as this one, a little bit smaller. Uh, and then um, these, these results are, are discussed uh, among experts, uh, among, uh, among um, other stakeholders. Uh, and then there's a complex process of, of voting and, uh, and discussions. And then uh, the goal is to both reduce any more, kind of even more the, the amount of categories, but, 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 not, but not too much. So you want to have those important ones within those core sets. And just to complete, we have also done the same thing actually in parallel for ADHD. So after, after all of this work, the autism core sets that were um, now published or some time ago, um, the comprehensive sets, they have 111 categories. And you can see here that most of those categories are those um, that try to capture ac activities and participation and, and, and environmental factors. So 90 of these, um, of these categories actually are um, in the field of environmental factors and participation. Then there are also brief core sets. Um, here it's um, that, that the 111 categories are ranked uh, by, pe by, by experts and stakeholders uh, according to their, to their kind of priority and their, how important they are. And then you, you, you cut at a certain point so that you get even a brief reset. And then there are also brief core sets for certain age groups, particularly when you work with certain age groups. So 0 to 5, 6 to 16, and 16 and older. There has been a little bit of critique also towards the, the core sets. One, one general critique is that all people who actually um, think only in functioning think we should not have core sets because that destroys the whole idea of functioning. So we should not, so we want to have individualized assessments and then when we use core sets then actually we are from the start doing something like we, like we did before or that we normally do for instance with the ICD. Uh, another critique also has been that um, isn't it so that for almost everyone um, it's maybe always the same, always the same categories that are important. Uh, for instance, we compared here what kind of categories are in the core sets for autism, for ADHD, and cerebral palsy. 
And what you can see here that um, uh, the red columns are for ADHD and the blue, the light blue ones are for ASD and the white ones are for CP. And then you have, you have um, uh, one for the, for the body functions, which is the B. You have the D for the activities and participation. You have the E for the environment and you have the S for the structures. You can see that actually, even though they have certain overlaps, they also have quite a bit of differences. So even though there are overlaps, it makes complete sense also to have diagnosis-specific core sets. That's what we conclude. Another thing that we have also done is uh, we have um, just last year, uh, together with uh, the International Society for Autism Research and together with the Autism Science Foundation, Stony Brook University um, and um, Curtin University, made a, a policy brief for employment for adults on the spectrum. Um, it's, it's a policy brief where the recommendations are given, uh, especially to, to employers, but also to people on the spectrum and their relatives, what, what you need to think about to, when you want to get people with autism uh, into the workplace and what, what are the important um, components of this. And when we did uh, studies around this and we have made a, a qualitative study, for instance, uh, which is published that you can see here, there's also um, a survey study that's just under review. And we could see that the, the concept that we had derived uh, in, for instance, the qualitative study, where we um, derived concepts based on uh, all the interviews that we had made with employers, people on the spectrum, their relatives and experts, that we could find, that we could find lots of these concepts actually represented in the ICF core sets. So it seems to be that it doesn't really matter in which areas you are working, uh, those core sets will all, always give you a decent idea of the functioning aspects that are important in this context um, when you look at a certain individual. So that's another kind of validation of the study, of, of, the, of the instrument. Then, um, at the moment, you could say that um, the core sets are, they are not, it, it's not an instrument, it's not ready, completely ready to use when you're not very familiar to work with the ICF, it's, it, it is a standard selection of items uh, or categories that are most important to autism. It's not yet translated into, for instance, questionnaires, interviews, observation scales, and other tools that we often use when we do diagnostic assessments and when we, when we measure outcome and so forth. So that's something that we're actually doing at the moment. We are trying to translate those categories into instruments that uh, we all want to use and are, are normally kind of using and are able and used to use. Um, and make it maybe also computer-based and use, using a little bit artificial intelligence to make them, them good and easy and understandable to, to administer and to make a good scoring, to make a good interpretation, to make a ranking of, for instance, abilities and disabilities and, and make visible where are, the, where are the facilitators and where are the barriers and so forth. So that's what we're doing at the moment. So for, for me, it's, uh, it's most important, and that's maybe my, my take home message, that we, that we all here and maybe even beyond this building start to think more in these terms. So for me, at the moment, the ICF is mostly something that I would like to, that I would like that people who, who work in autism have this, this thinking that we cannot just focus on a diagnosis within an individual, that there's so many other factors within the individual and also so many outside of the individual that are very, very important for functioning and the resulting quality of life. But if you want to look more at the, at the uh, ICF and also the core sets, the, um, the ICF research branch, they have a homepage and it's icf-core-sets.org. And um, in this resource, you will find all core sets, not only the ones for autism, but also ADHD and, and a lot of others um, in um, English, German, French, Spanish, Mandarin, and Finnish. Um, and um, you can find all of them there. And then, for instance, if you would go on, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you use this link here in the middle, then you would come up and could see all of these um, core sets, and then you can make yourself a, a documentation tool 
and it looks like this to the right. So then you have, you have the categories and what they actually want to assess. You can see, you can, you can register where, um, where the information comes from and you can use a so-called um, qualifier. So you can make an estimation if this is a, if this is a barrier or if this is a, if this is a strength or so. So that's something that you maybe would like to, to look at. Um, then I know there are many Australian people here, right? Where are you? Good. So you know, you know. So, so you, you you may you may um, you may think that what I'm telling you about the ICF is something that I'm only dreaming of, um, which I'm doing. But on the other hand, it's it's really something that is already out there. So, for instance, in the in the Australian National Guidelines for Autism Assessment and Diagnosis, the ICF is is in there as as the main uh, framework for assessment and it's also recommending to use the ICF core sets for autism for tool development so it's there and there are other there are other things happening in different countries where the ICF is actually kind of coming up and, and I would think and hope that in about I don't know maybe 10 years from now uh, we use the ICF in many many places a lot more then of course um, this is nothing that I have done myself so um, there are many, many people who have contributed actually around the world because it's a WHO project. I would particularly like to thank uh, uh, my colleagues at home in, in Stockholm and of course all the, the funders in Sweden who have made this uh, possible. And then I stop here. Thank you very much.